want to uh, thank everybody for uh, coming um, and uh, have a brief explanation of how this got underway and got started. Uh, I, I never, was my idea. Um, I had no intention of writing a book, I guess. Uh, I was contacted uh, probably sometimes in 2018 by uh, Buzz Deedley, who worked for Foster's Daily Democrat. And he wanted to know if I would write an article or a series of articles about Dover history. I had been uh, on the board at Woodman uh, Museum for a, a couple of years. Uh, and I thought it might be interesting to do. And the first few articles I did were based uh, almost totally on my memory of growing up in Dover and uh, who lived where and where the local grocery stores were and, and things that I participated in uh, growing up. As I got doing that, I started looking at some of the materials here in the library. Uh, and there's really a lot um, that, that I wasn't aware of that is here. Um, and I got really hooked, I guess, on going further into it, reading old newspapers and uh, other material to find out what uh, had happened in our past. So uh, over a period of three years, it ended up with the, the number of articles that's, uh, that's in here. Uh, if anybody's interested to come down, the history room is across the hall from, uh, from here. <clears throat> there was a man named John Scales. He was the principal of Franklin Academy, which was uh, located here in Dover, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But uh, John Scales uh, wrote a history of Stratford County, and a good part of that was um, biographical summaries of the leading citizens of Dover. And that's fascinating uh, material because uh, a lot of those people were alive during John Scales' life. So he was writing from his experience, knowing these people and, and going back. There's a, a book uh, called Landmarks in Ancient Dover, which I had never uh, seen before by a woman named Mary Thompson that she wrote in 1892. And it is full of all kinds of uh, off the wall information, things that uh, you wouldn't uh, think anybody would be interested in. But one of the articles in here I, I wrote is about the hills in Dover. And she's got a whole list of uh, you know, 20 or 30 places that were called hills. And you don't think of Dover as being a hilly community, really. But uh, so that book was fascinating. And there's also the book by Kathy Bowden, who was the librarian here, and Bob Whitehouse, who was probably a, a real historian uh, years ago. Very detailed information about the port of Dover. Uh, and that's well worthwhile uh, reading. And that's uh, all of that's right here in the library that uh, you can look up. So I have to give credit where credit is due. I read uh, all of that information and, and a lot of Foster's uh, Daily Democrat going way back and stole a whole bunch of information from these other people and, and put it together in, in my uh, articles. The book that you have is not quite perfect. We didn't um, uh, we ended up having a problem with the publisher on this. So there are some mistakes in here. There is a, um, uh, two photographs, uh, the same photograph that appears in here twice. One of them has the wrong caption on it. You'll, you'll see that uh, uh, in there. And uh, he left out uh, a preface that I had written and sent to him and saying, I want this um, in, in the book. And in that preface, I gave uh, credit to uh, Carolyn um, uh, 
uh, I forgot, forgot. <laughs> just lost the last name. Who's, huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, who's responsible for all the photographs in here? Uh, Tremblay. Uh, uh, she went through all of the uh, uh, photographic records that the library has and picked out photographs that relate to the articles that I put in it and really did an excellent job. And then she was the one who went back and put everything on a thumb drive that eventually went to the publisher. So I owe her a real debt of gratitude for putting this thing together. And the other thing was that uh, I mentioned the moral support that I had from uh, uh, my partner uh, sitting up in the back who uh, was a real help through all of this thing, made it possible, Joanne Rohde. Um, so uh, I decided that uh, making the presentation tonight, I wasn't gonna just sit down and read from this. Uh, I think that can be kind of boring at times to have somebody just sit and read to you. Um, um, and besides the, the idea of this, this is a fundraiser for the Dover 400th anniversary. And we hope you want to buy the book yourselves and read it yourselves, not have me uh, read it to you. So um, I thought what I would do is just start off with... Um, uh, focus on the property where we are right now, the library and the land that surrounds uh, this and talk about history in general and how we approach uh, history and we think about it. When, uh, as I, I say, I grew up here and my understanding of the history of Dover uh, uh, relates to everything that you see around you. That was my frame of reference growing up. The library was here, the, the McConnell Center now was, the high school was here, St. Thomas was here, the city hall was here. That was my, that was Dover for me. But historically, that's only a very tiny part of what Dover was. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to just forget about all these buildings that are here for now. And this is an empty lot from Atkinson Street all the way out to what is Central Avenue. Uh, nothing, is, nothing is on here. Um, and, and this would be, um, say, starting in 1800. Um, In 1806, a man by the name of, uh, uh, let's see, William Hale, uh, who was a merchant here in Dover. He moved from Portsmouth and came to Dover and began to um, uh, buy and sell things through the what came up on the river. William Hale bought this land this area here. Um, and in 1806, he built a house facing Central Avenue. Uh, it was a very large, what they call federal house, three and a half stories, very fancy, had a, had a uh, very fancy uh, front entrance. And if you think about, the, go back to that time and put the buildings out, there was no, there were no mills at that time. So where he was located in the front of the city hall lot, what we call the city hall lot, he had a clear view off that height across what we now think is Henry Law Park, all the way out to the river and down the river. And, and that was his home. Now, next door to that, uh, at or about the same time was a wooden church, St. Thomas Episcopal. And as a result of that being there, we have St. Thomas Street uh, is there. 
And Hayes, uh, uh, rather Hale lived there uh, for a, uh, a long time. In 1817, he hosted President James Monroe, who was here in Dover for a visit and had dinner uh, and guests and the VIPs in Dover at the time uh, came to uh, visit, uh, had dinner at that home. In 1825, he hosted uh, Marquis de Lafayette, who was making a national tour during that time. And Lafayette came to Dover and he actually stayed overnight at the Hale House at that time. And as a result of that, it picked up the name of the Lafayette House. Uh, so uh, you might see it referred to as Hale House or Lafayette House uh, because of that. Um, now, in uh, the first US census, census, the federal, first federal census was 1790. And that would have been 10 years before uh, the data I've picked. The population of Dover in 1790 was 1,996 people. That's a pretty small community. And forget about all the buildings that I talked about. There were very few relatively to what we have now. Most of the residences and buildings were on Central Avenue, starting at Pine Hill, going north, although it was, that area was called Pleasant Street at that time. Tuttle Square uh, was a very active area. Courthouse was there. There was a First Parish, uh, First Parish Church was there. Um, it was a hotel where St. Mary's School is now. A lot of activity in that particular area. And then continuing north to the, what we call the downtown and up to the upper square. Dover in the north probably stopped, uh, maybe at Ham Street, maybe at Hill Street. There were a couple of houses beyond that at the foot of Garrison Hill. There was Washington Street went only up to where the community trail is now. Beyond that was empty land, just like this plot here. Uh, there was a huge farm beyond that. The Coffin family owned that and they had a home uh, at the corner of Arch Street um, uh, at that time, but there was no Washington Street beyond, beyond that. Silver Street only went maybe Bill Knapp, maybe Cushing, and there wasn't much beyond that. The area of um, uh, Silver, Summer, Hamilton, Fisher was an empty field at that time. Um, so it was a pretty small, relatively small community. The people, the census broken down were 547 free white males who were 16 years and older. There were 418 free white males under the age of 16. That's a pretty young community. There were 1,005 free white females. 18 all other free persons. Now those would have been slaves who were no longer slaves, but there were eight slaves listed in the census in 1790. Um, now, picturing that community again, we tend to think of how we live now and what's happening around us. In 1800, keep in mind, there was no electricity. There were no street lights. There were no automobiles. Uh, there were no paved streets. 
You got around on foot, on horseback, or a wagon or a carriage. There were livery stables all throughout the community where like Avis and Hertz and whatever, you could run a horse, uh, <laughs> go in. A couple of the hotels in those days advertised that they had rooms in the restaurant and access to livery so that you could you were coming into town at all, you knew you had, you had a ride, you could rent, rent the horse. Um, some of the houses that we have, and, they, and they're still there if you drive around and look at them, uh, there were no garages because there were no cars, but there were carriage houses. And they were set back and the carriage houses were what they, say they were for the carriages. And, and some of the families housed their horses in the carriage house. And if you go up um, along Silver Street and look carefully, there are a number of buildings all along there who, where there are now garages or uh, some of them have been made into condos, I guess. But those were where the transportation was kept uh, at that time. Uh, there was no railroad. Railroad didn't come to Dover until 1842. You lit your homes with candles or lanterns. Uh, when the mills were built, they were lit with candles or lanterns. Um, And most people had wood stoves. They cooked on wood stoves or they cooked in the fireplaces. There were still homes with fireplaces and you've seen them with the, the handles to hang the pots and pans. Uh, it was very different from a uh, way of living at that time. When you went out to buy food, it was either, you either grew it yourself, it was very local, or it came from Rawlinsford or Barrington or some very close community. Um, diets were very restricted as a result. There weren't many um, butchers around who give you lamb chops and things like that at the time. There were, fish uh, because we're close to the seacoast. And there was a, uh, uh, transportation was very much by the river. Now the river at that time was very shallow and uh, uh, the bankings were uh, closer to the, there was not much of a channel. So anything that was brought up by the river would be a small boat. And that's where we get the gundalos that pictures that you see, larger boats would come into Portsmouth, it was a big port. They'd be unloaded there. They would be brought up the river and they would be unloaded uh, uh, here in Dover. So gradually that grew as the community grew, the market grew, more traffic on the river. In the 1830s, in the 1840s, uh, the people who were the business uh, and political leaders in Dover began petitioning Congress for grants to dredge the Kachiko River. Um, President Andrew Jackson vetoed uh, a bill that would have um, allowed, and I think it was something like $3,200, which was a lot of money back then, but for, for dredging the river in the Kachiko. Once Jackson was out, they had a better pull with the people in Congress. They began to get annual um, grants. The river was dredged. The ships they could bring in would be larger and larger over a period of time. Uh, it wasn't until the 1870s, uh, pretty much, when a lot of work had been done that you 
uh, they could bring up the schooners that you see in a lot of the old photographs that were, and they were pretty good sized boats uh, that would bring in a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of materials, different materials. In 1800, the mill buildings weren't here yet. They, um, uh, th there were smaller mills. They were uh, grist mills or lumber mills uh, for the most part. There was a very small cotton mill that was started in downtown Dover. But the, the mills as we know them now uh, really didn't start until about 1818. And they were, then they were built in sections. The whole thing wasn't built at one time. As the build, business expanded, the mills expanded. Um, and originally it was all water power uh, uh, that, uh, that ran the mills. The mills were built with brick, as, as you know, they're still here. Probably the first public building in Dover to be built with brick was the Franklin Academy that I mentioned earlier. Now, Franklin Academy was uh, constructed between what we now call Orchard Street and what used to be Waldron Street. There's an entrance off Central Avenue and along by the river. At that time, that area was an empty lot. There were no buildings along Central Avenue. That brick block that's there now, Harvey's Bakery and those, that building wasn't there when the uh, Franklin Academy was built. Uh, there was a nice grassy slope down to the river uh, on the north side. And uh, there was a, an open area on the south side of uh, Franklin Academy. So uh, as a result of Franklin Academy and then the mills being built, the, the uh, brickyards in Dover, uh, uh, did a, a booming business for a number of years uh, because supplying the bricks for those, those buildings was a ready market for that. Um, uh, just this is an anecdote. Um, in 1913, there was a substantial fire in Portsmouth and the uh, buildings from probably Pleasant Street east, almost to the river, three block area were completely burned. They were all wooden buildings. As a result of that, the Portsmouth City Council passed an ordinance saying any future construction uh, in that area was to be by brick. And uh, the brick they used came from Dover. Um, Portsmouth probably isn't willing to admit to that, but uh, uh, a, a good portion of downtown Portsmouth is made of Dover brick. Uh, now, the, the land that, um, and I'm not positive of this, but the land that William Hill bought would have been from Central Avenue almost to Atkinson Street, probably just north of Kirkland and all the way down to St. Thomas Street. It was there. Hale Street didn't exist for a while. That was part of the, the empty lot. Um, in the 1850s, uh, William Hale Jr. built a house right where we are today facing out this way. And that was probably the time that Hale Street was put in to provide access for, for this house. That's my, my guess. It was really a lovely house. And there is a picture of it uh, on page 136 of, of the book. Once you buy it, you can you know, look it up. Um, uh, so, you had um, the Hale uh, House on Central Avenue with the St. Thomas Church, and you had the William Jr. House here. The rest of it was still open land. 
1889, the then uh, Dover City Hall burned for the second time. Now that was located where uh, the uh, uh, Masonic Temple is today on Washington Street facing home. Uh, the uh, town fathers decided that they weren't going to do it, take a third chance. They were going to move it and build it someplace else. So they made a deal with the Hale family to buy that property out on Central Avenue. As a result, the Hale house, William Hale's uh, home, got moved over to what was Hale Street. Was it that came to it? Um, uh, the uh, wooden church, St. Thomas, uh, was torn down. The new stone church that we know was uh, built uh, all on William Hale land. Uh, and then uh, I think it was 1901, St. Thomas Church bought the Hale house next door and turned it into the parish house for the, for the church. Um, in place of the Hale house in the old St. Thomas Church was built a new city hall and it was known as the Opera House. And there's a picture uh, in the book of that. It took out almost all of that uh, block, pretty much as the present city hall does. Now that, that was an amazing building. Uh, there was the municipal offices that were there and, and uh, uh, kept the records and, and uh, everything that belonged to the city. But there was a very large auditorium on the second floor. It was big enough to accommodate 1,800 people. It had a main floor. It had balconies uh, on it. And the floor was, if you're familiar with the, the Opera House in Rochester, it was one of those hydraulic floors. It could be raised this way if you were having lectures and something going on on the stage. It could be lowered and flattened if you uh, were having a, a dance or a dinner or, or what was going on. Uh, that was in constant use. Um, there were, uh, uh, at that time, there were traveling uh, theater groups that went from city to city. And so there would be a, a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin was a big favorite, uh, would come here and they did that. John Philip Sousa's band played here uh, at, that, at that time. Uh, local um, uh, uh, shows that, uh, that they would have um, with local performers and uh, 800 people would come to those on a regular basis. Um, now the, uh, oh, and, and, and some of these shows that would come in it was interesting to me, that would be they said the railroad came in in 1842. They would come in on, on the railroad in cars. They'd unload from the railroad. They'd move everything down here, set it up for a night or two night um, show, unpack everything, go back into, move on to whatever the next town was going to be for, for the show. Uh, the uh, opera house was the site of, uh, very early motion picture shows, as early as 1896. Uh, there was, you can see in, in the paper, advertised uh, movies that were such as they were back then. But uh, it, it was a major uh, thing. And now, what happened to that was in, 18, in 1933, there was another fire and that burned. Uh, down. Um, this is the replacement. It's something substantially less than what we had the year before uh, in, in terms of the auditorium, certainly. But one of the, the 
real drawbacks of that was that a, a huge number of municipal records were destroyed in the fire. And uh, that was a real loss. This building, if you uh, uh, built in, in 1934, one of the big uh, factors on that was it was to be fireproof. And so there were all kinds of materials that were put in there to guarantee that there was going to be no more uh, major losses of our, of our uh, uh, city halls. And so far, it's, it's worked, I don't think. Um, now, the uh, the house that was here that you, you can see the picture in William Hale Jr. That was here as as. Great a house as it looks from the thing was was here less than fifty years, and what happened was in um, uh, 1896, um, Franklin Academy closed, and um, the people who were several of the people um, who were trustees of Franklin Academy were also trustees of the local library association. There had been a library in town um, uh, for quite a number of years, uh, very much small scale. The original one was in one of the mill buildings. The, uh, and, uh, I'm looking at it, one of the civic contributions of the mill owners was to make space available for a, a library. Uh, it moved to um, the Oddfellows Hall, which was a three and a half story wood building on Washington Street, uh, right at the end of Locust, uh, where the, um, the uh, hardware store parking lot is right now. Uh, during urban renewal in uh, uh, 1976, there were a number of people who came forward to try to save that building because it was quite unique. The interior was uh, uh, all wood uh, for the most part. Big uh, wooden staircase going up. Uh, uh, banisters were hand done. There was a levels on the second floor uh, going up the third floor. Uh, um, a lot of people never got there because if you didn't belong to the odd fellows, you didn't get into the hall. Uh, but that was a lovely open space up there. It was a very nice uh, building. Retail on the first level, but then uh, various businesses on second and on third. Um, anyway, uh, the library was in that building for uh, a period of time. Now, uh, two of the um, trustees of Franklin Academy were uh, uh, Elisha Brown and uh, uh, w William Cartland. Um, they took the money from the sale of Franklin Academy and they bought this land uh, from William Hale Jr. and the Hale family, whoever was left. And they donated the land to the city of Dover for purposes of building a library. Now these were, not only were they trustees of Franklin Academy, they just happened also to be trustees of the Library Association. And um, so, uh, the, uh, the William Hill Junior House was demolished. Uh, this is a Carnegie Library. The, the uh, money was donated by the Carnegie Fund for uh, the original building that was here. And where you're sitting now is what was built uh, uh, around the turn of the century. And 
1900. It's interesting that uh, William Cartland's daughter, um, and I didn't write her. Write her name down here. You remember what her first name was? <laughs> well, anyway, William Cartland's daughter ended up as the librarian. Uh, it sounds like a good case of nepotism to me. Uh, but apparently, she was very good at it because she remained the librarian for the next 50 years. Uh, and um, uh, still holds the record, I think, for uh, longevity here at the, at the library. Um, the the uh, uh, Hale House beside the church uh, has been accepted into the National Register of Historical Places. It's one of the uh, maybe half dozen buildings in Dover that have been approved for uh, for that purpose. And the owner at the time that building was bought and moved was the granddaughter of the first William Hale that had come down through two generations. And, and the granddaughter was Sarah Lowe. Now, Sarah Lowe is a uh, uh, very interesting person from the history of Dover. Uh, she was known, uh, you, and you may have read about uh, the Civil War nurse. Um, the, uh, there were several uh, uh, family, her father was a doctor. Her brother had been postmaster for a period of time. And when the Civil, middle Civil War uh, started, uh, she left Dover, single woman, uh, went to Washington and uh, worked in a number of the hospitals and, and uh, uh, f medical facilities that the Union Army uh, had at that time. The interesting part is she wrote letters back on a regular basis to the family talking about the experience in the hospitals and, and uh, the injuries to the people and the, uh, who else was there and the number of supplies. And it's a very fascinating uh, thing. And the history room has all of that information about uh, that. And one of her letters describes uh, a visit to the uh, uh, White House in late 1864 where she personally met Abraham Lincoln and had a brief conversation with him at that time. Um, so um, up until 1901, the original Hale family was still involved in the transactions that were going back and forth about, uh, about this uh, property. Um, there are no Hales around. Uh, and they're gone, that family. Uh, this William Hale was not related to John P. Hale, who was the uh, uh, senator and the owner of the building that's at the museum. They were a different, different family. Um, and then I just mentioned about brick buildings, the Hale House and the, the museum uh, house were brick buildings. They were built around 1812 or uh, within that uh, time frame. So there was a fair amount of uh, brick uh, uh, construction at that time that was uh, was going up. Uh, now the um, uh, gradually we were still talking about uh, unpaved roads and no cars and whatever. Uh, in, um, at some point, there were horse-drawn um, uh, trolleys. And the horse-drawn trolleys went from the bridge at Sawyers, uh, originally as far as Garrison Hill. And the people who put the company together uh, uh, for the trolleys 
uh, had a, uh, an operation on the top of Garrison Hill uh, that they charged admission for, uh, I forget whether it was a dance hall maybe, or a roller skating ring. Um, and uh, in the tower, and you could go up the tower for 10 cents and whatever and see the view. So these were real entrepreneurs. They, they developed the top of the thing as a tourist attraction, and then they created the trolley to get you back and forth to, to do that. Um, there was a woman in town, uh, Mrs. Dow, and uh, the folks here today who are living in Mrs. Dow's house up on Silver Street. But Mrs. Dow um, was married three times, outlived her husbands. And uh, at some point she invested and bought stock in the trolley company. And um, the operation on the top of Garrison Hill uh, wasn't doing very well financially. The people wanted to uh, get rid of it. Uh, they were gonna have a sale. Um, uh, they had a meeting of stockholders. The uh, uh, vote was taken on what to do. And it happened that Mrs. Dow had bought just enough stock that she was able to bid on the trolley company and buy it and it upset some of the town fathers that, uh, well, there was a woman now. And uh, it was fairly well known. Uh, it became a, a, a news item uh, in a good part of uh, the United States that she was the first woman CEO of a transportation corporation. <laughs> now, what she did was she dropped the price of the tickets for the trolley from six cents to five cents. And she sold advertising on the backside of the tickets. And the backside of the advertising made up for the loss of the penny and exceeded the loss of the penny. So all of a sudden the trolley company was making money. Um, about two years later, a guy named Burgett uh, who was from Massachusetts, uh, came to town, and he was in the process of developing uh, an amusement area up by Will End Pond. And he negotiated with Mrs. Dow to buy the, the uh, trolley company. She sold out. He extended the trolley from Garrison Hill to Will End Pond. And then within I forget exactly, but within five to 10 years, uh, electricity had come in. They electrified the trolley uh, uh, service uh, and the, you could get on Sawyer's and go all the way up to Will End Pond uh, where they had a, uh, a baseball diamond. Uh, they had a roller skater rink. They had um, a bear pit. They had a, um, uh, dancing pavilion. Uh, they had shows uh, uh, that were there. Entertainers came from outside the area into it. It was a, a pretty major operation for uh, quite a period of time. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to hold you beyond an hour, and I don't know if anybody has any questions uh, about what we've talked about, but if you uh, if you're reading the book or you're just thinking about Dover history, uh, I think it's uh, I enjoyed going back and saying, well, no, wait a minute, what was it like back then? What was life really like back then in, in Dover, where there were you know, none of these buildings, none of these people when it was a 3,500 people, there was 6,500 people uh, here. And, uh, it was a, that's, that's history. Uh, and, and we don't, at least for me, uh, don't think about that as being what this community was like for, you know, 
at least 300 of the 400 years that we're talking about here. So, so anyway, if anybody has a question, you have to holler at me because I have a hard, uh, bad hearing. But um, yeah. When you're talking about Willem Pond, the recreation area, I didn't quite hear it. Did you say a beer pit or a bear pit? A bear, a bear pit. Bear. Yeah, and and if and if you go up, if you go up there, uh, uh, some kid from Summersworth is a um, a Boy Scout um, Eagle Scout program uh, revived that pit. It, you can go up there and you can see where it is, and it's been uh, opened. It, it, it is still there. Yeah. yeah. Change uh, uh, So, um, and, and you mentioned pond, and I meant to mention in talking about the library, there was a pond right here, uh, and and it was there for uh, for years. I think it was a natural pond. Um, uh, it uh, people said it had springs. In it, so that it would it would figure, but it was all uh, bulrushes and reeds and stuff, tadpoles, and uh, it was just a wild thing. Nobody really took care of it, but it was uh, when I was doing research and trying to figure out what about the pond. It was actually uh, owned by the mills, and there was a pipe from that pond that went through here and out along Hale Street and down the hill. And they used it in the process of uh, coloring the gigam cloth that was in there. Because when Henry Law bought the land for Henry Law Park from the mills, it was the description of the property owned by the printing company that, was, that sold it. And in that description is the right they reserved the right to continue the use of the water from the pond uh, at that period of time. So that was that was what that pond was all about. It was connected with the mills for a period of time. And then it went into disuse um, and it was filled in. And I had forgotten this, although I was around at the time, where the um, uh, Greek Ascension Annunciation Church is now. There used to be a larger brick church that was Unitarian before uh, it was a Greek church. And um, uh, that burned. Um, and I forget now whether it was 1957 or 1967, but it was uh, completely destroyed uh, at the time. And in doing research, what I found was they took the debris from that church and they used it to fill in the pond. And, and there was a reference in there to Unitarian pond <laughs> because that's, that's what happened to the pond and then they, they tarred it over. So part of the uh, parking lot out here, I don't know whether it's still bubbling away underneath <laughs> Uh, bubbling away or not, but uh, there was a pond there for a good 150 years, probably. And I think. 1957. Huh? 1957. 57. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The building next to the Hale House uh, that Captain Killen is now in is not one of the oldest in Newtown, and, and uh, is there a history there? The uh, the brick apartment building on the corner. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know the year that that was built, but that was built by, uh, I don't have it in here, uh, but it was built by one of the major developers uh, in Dover at the time and, and was a very nice uh, building at one point. Um, you know, they came along at some and put all of the uh, retail facades in the front, which detracted from the original building, but uh, at one time that was a premier property. Uh, it was, and I don't know the year that it was, that it was done. 
Are you talking about the old, uh, about the old um, type of facility at all? No, uh, I don't think he, he's talking about the one right at the corner. Pythian Hall is further up the street. Uh, on that. Well, I, yes, I had a question come online that I want to pass on. That is, um, they're asking for a few words about Wentworth Douglas Hospital. <laughs> I think I know who asked that question. Uh, um, hi, John. <laughs> Um, well, uh, one of the articles in here is that um, uh, Wentworth Douglas, you, you think it's always been here. I mean, you, it's like a, a, an institution. Wentworth Douglas Hospital was not the first hospital in Dover. There was a hospital on Summer Street, uh, the Hayes Hospital, and there is a picture of that in, in here. And it was, it was, uh, uh, staffed by um, two doctors who lived actually in the neighborhood, two or three houses away uh, from that. And there was a woman who was a, the superintendent of the Hayes Hospital for a number of years. And that was the only hospital in Dover for uh, uh, a good period of time. Yeah. Yeah, at Hayes Hospital? <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, the, uh, there was a man named Antioch Wentworth. Uh, he was actually from Rollinsford, born in Rollinsford, but uh, he, he gave a lot of money to Dover for a variety of things. And uh, he went to uh, uh, Boston and opened up a business and he made a lot of money. Um, and I'm trying to think of was bluestone or some kind of uh, uh, building material that he made a lot of money on and um, uh, uh, retired at, at one point. He, he's responsible for Wentworth Institute on Huntington Avenue in Boston. He put, uh, Founded that, created it, funded it, uh, uh, and I assume endowed a lot of money. But he came back here and he gave, um, and I think it was a hundred thousand dollar endowment uh, to the city to build a hospital here, and uh, that was a huge amount of money at, at that time. So for a long period of time, it was a Dover. City Hospital, and there was a woman superintendent there, Miss Mary Haskell, uh, who was the superintendent for a long time at uh, Wentworth Hospital. Wentworth Hospital had a nursing school. There was a building adjacent to the main building uh, for a number of years, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, women uh, went there and graduated and, and stayed, I suppose, some of them went, went with hospital. Um, the um, Wentworth also gave money for the Wentworth Home for the Aged next door to the hospital. That, that is his also. Now, the um, uh, woman, uh, the Douglas part of Wentworth Hospital uh, is a, an endowment um, by a woman who lived in this house right here. Uh, her husband died and at her death, she had left a substantial amount of money uh, to increase the size of the hospital. Uh, the original Wentworth Hospital was a, uh, uh, a very small building I forget it's in here. There were either 10 beds on the men's side and 10 beds on the women's side and all the administration and the operating rooms and stuff was in the middle. And if you went by, there, was, there were porches on the Central Avenue side with awnings. It was a very attractive building. And, uh, and I'm assuming that if you were recovering uh, they would be able to wheel you out on the porch and you'd sit in the fresh air and 
whatever it was, period. The building next door uh, uh, was built uh, for the nursing school, was money from the Rollins family from uh, Rollinsford. Uh, there was Senator Rollins and a number of family members that were quite wealthy, Boston banking and the, they, uh, they gave the money for that building. And so for a, a number of years, oh, and the interesting part was there was a, a connecting walkway between the two buildings. There was also a tunnel. You could go from one building to the other building in a tunnel. The nursing school went out of business. Doctor's offices went in. There were uh, uh, some uh, uh, medical related uh, businesses that were in there. And that building has been torn down and replaced by, by what's there today. But, uh, and there is an article, at least one in here about medical doctors in Dover and it had a very high quality of uh, medical care from everything that I could uh, find and read. There were no, um, well, not until the 20th century anyway, there were no malpractice cases and, <laughs> uh, and complaints about uh, the level of care. But, um, anyway, all right, thank you very much. Uh,